Hello, everybody, and shalom. Welcome to another installment of the FM International Ministries Teaching. And I uh, hope your day and your week has been a blessed one. Uh, for guys that um, need to know, we're going to celebrate our Pentecost vote starting at sundown tonight until sundown on uh, tomorrow night, May 31st. Hey, guys, I'm going to continue this the series that I started several weeks ago called We Are Doing It To Ourselves. This will be part seven. And uh, like I've always announced, this is based on Prophet Tom Decker's teaching that he did called The Fire My Touch Not The Profane. And I hope that this message, again, is a message of encouragement to help you along your journey to become all that God has destined you to be. Okay? I don't think we're going to be here a long time, but we'll see what the Holy Spirit does. But before we get started, let's go to God in prayer. And then we'll get into our lesson for today. Father God, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Yeshua. First of all, I ask you to forgive us for our sins, whether those sins are sins of our mind, our words, or our actions. And Father, we ask that the holy blood, blood that Yeshua shed on that tree, that his blood would be a cleansing, not only for our sins, but for the sins of our family too. Master, we bless you, we praise you, we worship you, we honor you as the Lord God Almighty. You are supreme over everything. You need help from no one else. You rule this universe by the word of your power. And Father, we're so grateful and thankful for your mercy that you've extended to us, for the blessings you've given us over the past week. Thank you so much, Father, for everything that you've done for us, things that we recall, things that may, we may have slipped our mind. Now, Father, we pray your blessings upon this uh, convocation, this teaching today. Lord, may the words that are spoken be the words that you want heard. Rahakadish, we're asking that you would take these words, make them see to go into the people's ears, their minds, but eventually to their hearts and grow up in them, shape them and mold them, cause them to consider these things, that we can be more Christ-like. We can be the people that you destined us to be. Darkness, we come against you in the name of Yeshua and whatever uh, we come to you in the name of Yeshua. We command you to be gone. We command you to be under our feet. We defeat every uh, weapon that you're trying to form against this technology, against this meeting. It shall not prosper in the name of Yeshua. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to minister. In the name of Yeshua, we ask these blessings. Amen. Hey, everybody, turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, and we're going to start at verse Get this right. 16, Ezekiel 36, verse 16. And we're going to read several verses. And here we go. More, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries. And that's talking about us, Ephraim. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered, in, entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which is the house of Israel. <clears throat> and for those that have been in Ephraim, you know, when we see the words or the phrase, the house of Israel, that's also, also uh, the house of Joseph and the house of Ephraim. Had profane, profaned among the nation, whither they went. Verse 22. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine own holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Now, folks, this is exactly where we're headed. We're 
headed back to our own land, and that's Israel. And uh, so this gives us scriptural ordained proof that God is going to do this. This is a scripturally ordained pronouncement. Verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. For all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So when the scripture mentions that the Lord God will sprinkle clean water upon you, what does that mean? Let's look at verse 26. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, the laws. So this again is talking about the house of Israel, the house of Ephraim, and this is happening right now. Verse 28, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. So we have been scattered to the four corners of the world, of the earth, but we're coming back into our land, saying the same thing over and over again. Verse 29, and I will save you from all your uncleanness. And uh, he will do this by teaching us, guys, so we will not profane God's holy word, so we can stop doing it to ourselves. Let's finish 29. And I will call for the corn and will increase it and will lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and increase of the field, and ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. And let's stop there. How could we have been so stupid, guys? How could we have been so ignorant to not keep the Sabbath day? But guys, if you've ever had any condemnation about doing this or doing other things that the covenant called for in the past, stop it, forget it, don't do that. It was a matter of God's timing. See, there were two blindings. God blinded the Southern Kingdom, which is Judah, with not knowing that Yeshua was the Messiah, the Mashiach. Okay, and that was the blinding that God put on them. But he blinded the northern kingdom, us, Ephraim, too, not knowing that we should have been keeping the laws. We did receive Yeshua as Messiah, Messiah, excuse me, but we didn't know that God never told us to not keep the laws or his commandments. We were referred to as a cake not turned. That's in Hosea chapter 7, verse 8, and you can read that offline. So we were duped concerning the laws, just as bad as the Jews were duped concerning Yeshua. Let's continue with verse 32. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste shall be built, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And look at this in verse 35, and they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. When we go back to Israel, after all the conflict that happens, that land will be as the Garden of Eden. And the waste and the desolate and ruined cities uh, are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I am, excuse me, that I the Lord built the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I the Lord have spoken it and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will put yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And we're going to stop right there. So when we get back to Israel, the cities that were destroyed will be filled by us. They will be built back up. Now Israel has been paying the price for the sins of our fathers. They made decisions uh, that they are made to forsake the laws and to make up new laws 
to change the dates of the feasts, et cetera. And that decision is what we've been paying the price for for all these generations. God said that we would be dispersed to the four corners of the world and hunted down and killed everywhere we go. And your iniquity will overtake you. And that's been happening for centuries. But there will come a time when God will forgive us for our iniquities. And the iniquities that he will forgive us for is the abomination that we have become for not keeping the covenant. And our ancestors agreed to keep the laws that God gave Moses at Mount Sinai. If you go back and read those chapters in Exodus, our forefathers agreed to keep the laws. And when that agreement happened with God, that sealed the covenant between God and us. Not only for those that were there at the mountain, but for every generation that succeeded, succeeded those uh, folks who were actually there. Can you imagine ever doing anything in your lifetime that would make such an impact on the entire world that the world would see it. Guys, we have been given the privilege, the honor to be living in this generation, to see the things that we're seeing, to experience this revelation that we're getting, to be that chosen number of people that God has destined and ordained from the foundations of the world to be the catalyst to cause this paradigm shift from the way the churches have been doing things to the way God intended for his people to do things. We've been given that honor. We've been given that privilege. And we can't just blow it off. We can't just relax. We can't just do it when we feel like it. This is, our, this is one of the reasons that we exist in this world. This is part of all of our destinies. It's our job to plant the seeds to establish the law, just like uh, Romans 3.31 says. We don't void the law by faith, we establish the law. It's our job to communicate the importance to anybody that will listen that we have to establish the covenant. You need to keep God's laws. I don't care, it doesn't matter what you've been taught, what you've been led to believe, what Paul said or what Paul didn't say or what people misinterpreted Paul saying. We know that God never intended for his people not to keep his commandments. And it's our job to tell people. It's not our job to make them believe it, but it's our job to tell them. And it's up to God and the Holy Spirit to work with these folks to change their minds. But if we never plant the seed, it won't happen. Go ye therefore with a twist. So we've been given this honor. We've been given this privilege to have an impact on the world, one person at a time. One day, this exodus back to, to Israel would be on satellite TV. And we would proclaim to all the nations that we are the lost tribes of Israel and that we are coming back home. The Lord God has forgiven us for our iniquities and our abominations, okay? We will now feel the waste places. Everybody quickly turn to a very famous scripture we do all the time, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2. And we're going to have a few comments about that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. When you look at chapter 28, we've heard this before, but the first 14 verses, it talks about all the blessings that will come on you if you don't defile them. If you do the vow and you don't keep these commandments, then they won't come to you. Verse one, and it shall come to pass that thou should hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou should hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. You've heard that taught many times. These things are set to happen if we don't defile God's laws. And then the next few verses after uh, verse 2, all the way down to verse 14, literally tells us that there is nothing we can do, there's nothing we can say that God isn't going to bless. Okay? You're not going to be sick. 
You're not going to be bland. You're not going to be halt, et cetera. Your, your cattle will be fertile. The land will produce. And the blessings go on and on and on. And that's where we want to live. Amen? Of course we want to live there. But you've heard this taught too. When you look at verses 15 through 68, the scriptures explain what will happen to you if you defile the commandments. There's a lot more verses that explains the curses than the verses that explains the blessings. The church tried to convince us that we live in the first 14 verses if you accept Yeshua as your Lord and Savior. And that's not true. Just because you accept Yeshua, which we all ought to do, because the whole thing starts with Yeshua. Don't get me wrong. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. The whole thing with us starts with receiving Yeshua as the Lord and Savior. What do you do after you do that? Will the church convince us when you get Yeshua? Uh, if you get that, then all these blessings are going to automatically come into your life. And that's not what the scripture says. It specifically says you got to observe and do all of these things for that to happen. And if you go into most every church in the world, you're going to find some manifestation of verses 15 through 68 somewhere in those pews. So here we are. We heard the cry of Ephraim come home. We made the decision that we're part of God's children. And we do need to keep the testimony of Yeshua and the laws of our God. We learn that God never changed the Sabbath day. He never gave us Easter, okay? And we're gonna go back into a land that's flourishing, just like we read, it's gonna be as the Garden of Eden. So again, in verses 15 through 68 of Deuteronomy 28, it, it explains to us that if we defile God's commandments, if we defile the law, then these things are going to happen to you. You increase your chances of becoming sick. You increase your chances of being broke. You increase your chances of your families becoming messes. You increase your chances of some people that are going to be blind and have dim of eyes and weak of muscles and the curses go on and on and on. But if you will adhere to what has been spoken about in this series and get away from defilement as a lifestyle and spend time preparing when you go back to Israel, then there will be no sick among us. It's a promise of the word. And as we get a little deeper to making this our lifestyle, then we will stand out among our friends. You're going to stand out among your neighbors. You're going to stand out among your family members. It will not be unusual for people to want to ask you questions about what's happening in your lives or asking you to pray for them because they don't see you as sick as other people. And it goes on and on and on. We're the light. I keep saying we're the light that sits on the hill with the salt of the earth. There's got to be something in your life that attracts people to ask you that question. If your life is just like everybody else's, how are you attracting people? We're just a bunch of folks saying stuff with no physical proof to back up what we're saying. It's important for us to be blessed, guys. Write that in your notes. It's, it's, oh, it's very important that we keep these laws so there's a distinction between us and other people. So God can do what he promised, to lift us up above all the nations of the earth. Otherwise, he can't do it because we're not keeping the law. We're defiling the commandments. And he's not going to automatically give it to us because we receive Yeshua as our Lord and Savior. You've got to put the work in, and that's keeping the laws. Um, let me say this so people don't misinterpret. You don't keep the laws to be saved. There's never a law that was given that could save you. You keep the laws because you are saved. I just quoted you Romans 3.31. We don't void the law because of faith. We establish the law because of our faith. That's what we have to do. There's got to be something in our lives that people can see that attracts them to you and me so we can explain to them. It was God's intention all along to have a people, to have children that will obey him so he could do the lifting. We don't lift ourselves. He does it. It's important that we be blessed. As we move away from defilement and keep the laws, we start positioning ourselves for blessings to come upon us and overtake us. We are the children of the Most High God. We are required to take the next steps to, go, to get from one glory to the next glory. We never arrive, but we're ever moving 
forward. And as more revelation knowledge comes forth to us, we take another step forward. Always, always, always remain teachable and prepare to transition into a deeper spiritual revelation. Turn to Jeremiah 5. Please turn to Jeremiah chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 19. All right, here we go. And it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Wherefore doeth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then shalt thou answer them, Like as ye have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, said the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by the perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it, and through the waves there will toss themselves, yet can they not prevail, even they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither shall they say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Let's stop right there. Some people don't even consider that it's the Lord God that provides us with rain so we can eat. And especially out here where we live in the Southern Command, the the Turks and Caicos Islands, if, you, if it doesn't rain where we live, there is no city water out here. If God doesn't rain, we don't drink. Plain and simple. But God has been gracious to us out here where we live. And it is, matter of fact, it's been raining all week. If it doesn't rain, we don't drink. Period. We need God's farming ladder rain. We have gotten comfortable with just going to our local supermarkets and buying what we need. But there is coming a day in North America, and I dare say around the whole world, when people will watch their children die in the streets due to starvation. Why? Because God shut off the rain as he sees fit. The blessings can become curses just that quick because of us defiling the things of God. We got to stop doing it to ourselves, guys. But yet we can become so proud and boastful because, hey, we're Christians and the blood of Jesus comforts us and takes care of all of our problems. It's our invisible force shield. But we're sick. Even though we got the blood over us, we're sick, we're wretched, we're poor, we're naked, we're naked and we don't even know it. But all of us have come to this point, and we all have been given the right of God to choose. We can make choices. We have a, a right to choose to accept Yeshua as our Lord and Savior. It was a choice to accept the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was a choice to go against the popular accepted doctrines of the church and understand that we need to keep God's laws. Look at Jeremiah 5, 25, real quick. Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden the good things from you. Very simple verse to understand. What's blocking the good things of God from coming into your life? Our sins. It's our sins that are holding back the good things from us. Is health a good thing? Yes. Is prosperity a good thing? Yes. Sound mind? Yes. Wouldn't it be great if the denominational churches were preaching and teaching this concept? We hammer on this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself. We hammer on this sin problem, not just because your sins, if you don't repent, will send you to hell, which it will do, but we hammer on sins because sins stop your blessings. It's like a, let me say it, it's like a force shield that stops God blessing you because he's not going to reward sin. He cannot reward disobedience. It ain't going to happen. He rewards consistent obedience. If it was taught that we as New Testament saints, if we knew this and, and 
and we would have a different concept about sin. We talk about sin consciousness. We don't have a sin consciousness because we want to do more sin. We want to have a sin consciousness so we can stop sinning so our blessings won't get blocked. Mm -hmm. But it's not being taught because we're New Testament saints. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me. And then he goes to the Father, he intercedes on our behalf, and we're in good shape. And then we go right back and we send the sin that we just repented for, and, and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work like that. But no, you can't do that. The scriptures tell us that Yeshua dealt with the man who had the infirmity for 38 years. Remember that story? What did he tell him after he healed him? He said, go and sin no more unless the worst thing come upon you. He told the guy, stop that stuff because you're going to block the blessings from coming on you and something worse will come on you. Listen to this, guys. We have got to make not sinning a priority in our lives. I'm going to repeat it. We have got to make not sinning a priority in our lives. It stops God's good things from coming into our lives. Stop doing it to ourselves. Quit it. Quit it. This is not being preached on a consistent basis. Because if it was, people would stop going to church, putting their money in the plates. And they can't afford that because they might it'll run the people off. They don't, people don't like people preaching about sin. You know, even in the churches that Lois and I were in, if they had a rough week, the last thing they want is for somebody to get in the beam of the pulpit and bang on them about your sins. They want you to tell them it's gonna be all right. They want you to tell them that you're gonna you can uh, have the hundredfold uh, return on your one dollar you're putting in, in the plate. They want to hear all that good stuff and pump you up. But this is pumping you up too. If you stop sinning, then the blessings will come. That's a, that's a message of encouragement. It's not a message of hammering and making you look feel bad. It's a message of stop doing that junk so God can bless you. To me, that's a blessing. That's a message of encouragement. It's not putting you down and making you feel bad. Come on. This ministry is about not building mighty buildings for services. We are trying to find Ephraim and build the nation through teaching and preparation to go back to Israel. That's what we're all about. And as we have learned, being obedient to keeping the commandments of God and keeping the testimony of Yeshua will bring blessings into our lives and prepare us to return back to Israel. Remember to hear what is being taught, make the choice, and do and see what happens in your life. Give it a shot. If you haven't, do it. If you've been doing it, keep doing it. Do it better. And all of us will always have the opportunity to say yes or to say no. Amen? Amen. Be blessed, everybody. And goodbye.